As Joe mentioned, uh, the Kirsten Lecture is our featured uh, keynote lecture. And this year, it is my very great privilege and honor to introduce the Kirsten Lecture. He is uh, Dr. Liez Lelui. He is the Chair Professor of Soil Mechanics and Geoengineering and CO2 Storage at the School of Architecture, Civil, and Environmental Engineering at EPFL in Switzerland. He is also a full professor at the Pratt School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke University here in the US. He is also vice chair of the Technical Committee uh, of International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering and the editor in chief of the International Journal of Geomechanics for Energy and the Environment. He obtained his PhD in soil and structural mechanics at the uh, Central School in Paris and his research interests focus on a few areas, notably the fundamental study of soils and man-made geosystems with emphasis on mechanics of various uh, interesting and multi-scale and multi-physics phenomena. This research has produced results in computational geomechanics, environmental geomechanics, and the mechanics of multi-phase porous materials. His awards and honors are are very long and quite lengthy and very distinguished, but of one note I did find that he was here in 2012 for the Vardalakis Lecture Award from the University of Minnesota. So welcome back, Dr. Lelui. And with that, Dr. Lelui, please come up to the podium and present us with your Kirsten Lecture. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. It's really a great pleasure and great honor for me to be here with you this morning to talk about um, this topic of energy geostructures. Uh, first of all, uh, th there are two reasons that I selected, for which I selected this topic. The first one is that I feel this is an area that is offering great opportunities to our geotechnical engineering community. So I think we have a role to play do there, and if we do not really take this lead in this area, other fields will, will do it. The second uh, reason for selecting this topic is related to the name of the lecture by itself, Kasten Lecture. Professor Kasten uh, did uh, significant contributions in, uh, in, in this field, and I will uh, try to show you how the work, pioneer work that he did, are really key uh, aspects in what we are developing those days. I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, many of my former and current collaborators uh, with whom I had the pleasure to develop this work. Uh, so Professor Kirsten, as uh, I was mentioning, he, he worked, among other things, uh, on uh, thermal properties of soils. He was the publisher of this uh, bulletin from uh, University of Minnesota. And uh, he developed very uh, pioneer things related to heat transfer. And as you will see in, uh, in my presentation today, heat transfer is a key element in what we will call energy geostructures and the way that we get energy from the ground and we store it there. Uh, there is uh, this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, really, when uh, I look to it, it could be or almost published today when we see the experimental methods and the theoretical approaches that uh, he uh, developed in that time, so um, this is also uh, a way for me to recognize uh, his contributions, and even for my recently published book on analysis and design of energy structures, I referred to his uh, contributions because, they, as I said, they were not only pioneer, but they still constitute a key element in what we are do de developing and working on today. So, uh, in this talk, I will uh, start by looking to the social and economical aspect of the thermal energy question in the construction sector. Why are we interested in this and why I feel it's really very important uh, element that we have to consider. After that, I will show how we could do this through what we call energy geostructures. I will spend a large part of my talk on the energy design, because this is related to the work of Professor Kirsten. So uh, I, I will explain what are the challenges, how we try to face their, them. I will talk about the geotechnical and structural aspects that I call mechanical aspects. And if time allow me, I will talk a little bit on the management of tensile stress in energy piles. 
So uh, I, I'm not sure whether you are really aware about the, the kind of energy that we need in the construction uh, sector in general. So usually when we, we look to the, the, this is the need of energy in general, and the construction sector represents more or less 30% of the needs, no matter where we are. So it depends from areas to areas, but let's say between 25% to 35%, it's related to the energy sector. And then in the energy sector, uh, in the construction sector, the kind of energy that really we need, as you can see it here, it's for more than 80% a thermal energy. It is related to space heating and hot water. So almost 80% of the energy is needed there. If you look, for instance, to lighting and other kind of electrical um, energies, they are really marginal. So the point here is that if we are able to provide this amount of energy from other sources then, uh, that those are polluting, and then we'll come back to that later on, this is what is our challenge those days. Because why I am saying this, because if we look to, so those statistics are for Europe, I guess they should be very similar in many other places around the world. So when you see the sources of energy that are currently used, so natural gas, oil, coal, biofuels, so all of them actually are non-renewable and they are polluting. And uh, when I'm saying this, the big issue, and you, I think you are, uh, we're aware about it, is that we have a direct relationship between the amount of cumulative CO2 that is produced from those, si those kinds of energy to the global or the, to the average change of temperature on Earth. So you see we are really increasing this amount of CO2 and we could, by developing new kinds of technologies, avoid to, sorry, avoid to use those kind of energy sources to go for something that is cleaner, that is renewable. And this is what I will try to convince you about. So my message here is that I feel that the biggest challenge those days is really how to get this thermal energy in a cleaner way and uh, in a way that we could really sustain our climate. So, of course, there are several initiatives at the international level that are happening. I'm mentioning here three of them in the U.S. A building with zero net energy consumption. So this is a concept well known. In Europe, we have exactly almost the same. A building with a very high energy performance. But then there are other countries like France where we have this building producing more energy that they need by themselves or for themselves. So this is something also going further. And I was reading yesterday, I think in Geostrata journal, uh, a new building in Oslo that is also producing more energy than what is needed for its own consumption. So how could we achieve this, uh, this goal? So one way to do it is what, by what we call energy geostructures. So what are energy geostructures? They are, they are simply all our structures underground structures made with concrete, they are in contact with the, the ground. And the ground has this uh, particular characteristic that where the temperature apart, the first part, let's say between two to five meter, the temperature in the ground is constant on over 100 meter. So we are having a constant temperature. There are reasons for that, of course, is equilibrium between atmosphere temperature and the ground temperature. And the idea is that to take advantage of this constant temperature, so to warm or to cool buildings simply by reference to this ground temperature. So how could we exchange this energy? So we need heat exchangers. So the heat exchangers could be any construction made in the ground using concrete in which we will put a way to exchange the energy between the ground and the buildings or infrastructures. So simply, this is the concept behind it. And in practice, so it's simply we add those kind of tubes, so they are really easy to, to handle, to have this uh, heat exchange. We have fluid circulating there, so usually it's a simple water, so there is nothing complicated. And then you can take your cage, you put it in your hole, and so on. So it's very simple 
technology, so there is nothing really complicated behind in implementing it. So, of course, the difference of temperature between what you have in the ground, usually, let's say, around 12 to 13 degrees Celsius, this constant temperature, with the needs in breathing for heating and cooling, is not enough. So we don't, we, 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 the idea is not just to pro provide that uh, level of temperature, so we have to enhance that uh, level of temperature, and we do this with what we call the ground source heat pump system. The ground uh, pump uh, uh, source heat pump system is based on the fact this is, you can imagine this is a kind of a pile foundation. You, we have a, a heat pump, so it's simply compressor that we compress our fluid, generate from it uh, more energy, so we enhance our delta T, and we can heat our building. We can take the heat from summer and we store it in the ground. We can do the same thing in winter where we could store cold temperatures in the ground, and this is the entire system. For, to do this, we have to provide some energy to our heat pump, and the idea is that if the ratio between the heat the energy that we are providing to the heat pump to the produced energy, if this ratio that we call COP, uh, coefficient of performance, is higher than three to four, so it means if we are multiplying our delta T by three to four times, then the system is functioning in a very satisfied way. So then we can engage in more uh, engineering aspect of this. So here you see some numbers that with the so this is my funded company dealing with those uh, uh, topics where we could guarantee given amount of energy for extraction and injection in the ground. For instance, if you have a pile, you can say easily that we can have something between 40 to 100 watt per meter of pile. So you can multiply this by the length of your piles, by number of piles, and you get the number of uh, amount of energy that you can get from that. You can do it for tunnels. You can do it for slabs. When it's tunnels and slabs, we, we, we use square meter, we use areas and still the linear values. But this allows us to know exactly how much energy we can get. And usually, the size of the foundations is proportional to the size of the building, and the amount of energy we get is proportional to the size of the building. And usually, we can cover the, the needed energy for the building. So what do we do with this uh, energy? We heat and cool our buildings. We produce hot water in areas like Minneapolis. We can de-ice the, the roads. We can de-ice the uh, deck of, uh, of bridges and so on. And very important, we can store the energy on the ground. So for instance, we can couple this with solar panels. The ground has very bad thermal characteristics. If you put the given energy there, you can be sure that at least 75% of this energy will remain there no matter the water flow conditions, no matter what are the external temperature variation. So the ground will constitute also a very way, very nice way to store excessive energy. So this is just a simple example here. This is a small building. It's a five-story office building. We have 32 piles rather small 50 centimeter piles, one uh, 20 meter length. We use a very simple U-tube shape, so we just put our um, uh, tu uh, plastic tubes there. And what you see here is the energy demand for this building in red heating, in uh, blue cooling. And basically, with a simple system, just U-tube system that we can put there, we are covering almost 95% of the need in heating and cooling. So this is an example for simple constructions that could go from individual house to small buildings. But we can go further and do large buildings, more uh, important ones. So I'm showing you here some of the projects on which uh, with my company we are currently working. I will show you two of them. The first one, we are in Seoul, in uh, South Korea. So we, we have this... Uh, the, the, this uh, area, here it's a gallery, one kilometer gallery that uh, is about to be constructed and we have lighting for it. And the idea here in this uh, project, we were requested to provide 
the heating and cooling for the entire one kilometer gallery, the whole malls, conference center with a constant temperature of 17 degrees Celsius over the year. We have 60,000 people uh, per day in this area and we have 20,000 square meter uh, of surface. This is a cross section, actually we have four levels and we are coupling our energy geostructure system with the natural ventilation system and all those circles that you see here our are our heat exchangers, so they are the play. So we are using them, here we have two levels for, of tunnels, we are using to extract the energy from here, from the, the, the walls, and all together we are having something like 60,000 square meter of equipped slabs and walls for the energy exchange. So what do we do with this amount of equipped surfaces? Actually, we are producing 100% of the need of heating and cooling of this building. We are getting more than 11,000 meta megawatt hour for heating, almost 10,000 for cooling, which is almost exactly what is needed for such a building. So we are creating a completely independent building from energy perspective with the recovery time from investment uh, perspective is about six years. This is a second uh, example that I would like to show you. So we are currently working on uh, providing also a given amount of energy for a new construction in Monaco, in the south of France, 150 units. We have the International School of uh, Monaco for 700 pipits, and we have seven levels of uh, underground parking. This is a uh, top view of the system. It's uh, important to show it to you because here we have walls here we have what we call barrettes. I will show you uh, this uh, in a second. Here we have piles, and the, everything is connected for this energy production. So if we have a cross section, we deal here with the dry area and saturated one, where the thermal characteristics are dependent from the, to the degree of saturation, and we have here, here the saturated area, and we are keeping all our piles, 165 piles, energy walls, all the walls that we have here and the barrett that you see here in green. So uh, what are those barrett? So let me just show you um, a small movie. So this is the construction, this is the tower. And it's a very important um, example, this one, because this project is running over three years. So you, you see here the date, we are here currently in the construction, which allow us first to design the first part here to test the performance of the design in real conditions and then to extend this knowledge to the next constructed part. So this, those, mo uh, those pictures, uh, uh, those movie, uh, this movie, we did it last May. So you see here our tubes inside the bars. We have those 70 meter uh, long bars that are sustaining the foundations and, and, and playing a role also of energy exchanger. So le let's now go to more technical aspect of the things. So in those perspective, what do we need? We need first to be able to design from energy perspective our foundations, so to know how much we can extract, how much we can inject, and then we have to evaluate what is the impact of this temperature variation on the stability of our foundations and uh, on the, the, their deformation. So let's start with the energy aspect. So the energy aspect, we can say, from a given perspective, is a rather elementary things because we are using very simple equations in the sense that we have heat convection inside the tubes, so those are plastic tubes. This heat convection will be transmitted to the ground through the heat conduction through the plastic, then through the, the, the concrete. The steel has exactly the same thermal characteristics as the concrete, so uh, this is why uh, I mentioned just the, the concrete. And then in the ground, we have conduction and we have convection. So, and with this, we can uh, design our heat exchange. So to make things easier, uh, we uh, approach the things with two stages. For each time, we developed what we call the pre-designed tools for practitioners, those things that everybody could use immediately as first attempt in the design. And then there is a second phase where you have to go deeper and look to, to the details. So for the pre-design, we developed such uh, charts where for different configurations, so different number of and shape of the tubes, depending on the diameter of your pile, for instance, 
And depending on the number of loops and thermal conductivity, the length of your pile, you can know immediately how much energy you could extract and inject inside your foundation. At the next stage, where we are really in design process, then we need an optimization of the system. We use for that numerical tools where we have to reproduce different kinds of circulation of the fluid, different hydraulic regimes, different um, shapes. So this is the kind of things that we reach at the next stage. For walls and the tunnels, things are a little bit different and uh, because the, the energy is coming from two sources. First, the energy is coming from the ground. This represents more or less 50% of the energy. And the other 50% is coming from the tunnel or the wall, if you have a parking, for instance. So, the, so from, for, from the ground, as I was mentioning, is uh, thermal conduction and convection. From the, the tunnel, actually, we use uh, the Newton law for energy exchange. So it's a simple uh, relation, a linear relationship between the temperature change and the amount of energy that we can get. And we have this coefficient here, convective heat transfer coefficient. And this coefficient is really very fundamental one to, to know, because depending on it, as it's a linear relationship, you can change all scenarios. So if you have it high, you can invest and you can rely on having a given amount of energy, but if you have it low, uh, it's not the case. And uh, so again, so this is for conduction part, and this is one for the convection, so if you have uh, the air and the ground. And it's known that this coefficient actually depends, among others, on the air velocity inside the tunnel. So we have also here a linear relationship between the, air, the average air velocity and the value of this coefficient. But this is not enough, actually, in, uh, in, in such analysis, because we can simply say, OK, let's imagine that we know that the value, we can use different configuration of our tubes inside a tunnel, and we also have those kind of charts for pre-design that let us know immediately how much energy we can extract or inject. But in reality, things are more complicated when we come to real design. For instance, currently we are working on designing an underground metro line of six kilometers, and we have to know what is the value of this coefficient along such, uh, such infrastructure. The point is that we cannot know it really before constructing the tunnel, because this coefficient depends also on the friction uh, that we have uh, with respect to the concrete, depends also on the braking of the trains, number of the trains that are running, the kind of trains running inside tunnels, and so on. So this makes it more complicated. And when you look also here are 3D simulations that we are doing here, it's our tunnel, you see the air velocity changing along the tunnel. So it means that our coefficient that is proportional to the velocity of air, the, it's happened that the velocity of air by itself is not constant along a tunnel. And if you do cross section, it's even worse. So even if you'd like to measure this coefficient, this is a cross section our tunnel. We have groundwater flow here, so we have this uh, exchange of energy. But you see also inside a tunnel, if even you have to measure your air velocity to get your coefficient, it's a very challenging aspect. And this parameter, it's a key one, as I was mentioning, because for any investment for such kind of uh, project, you have to know exactly from the beginning how much energy you can extract, because you will sell this energy. So you will have long-term contracts with clients, and you have really to commit yourself on something that you are sure that you can gain. Again, we did some pre-design uh, charts for walls, so you can have different configurations, and then you can make some calculations with them. Again, when we move to the real design part, so this is the, here you see simulation, 3D simulation of the foundations of the bridge, uh, of the tower that I was showing you in Monaco. So here are our barrettes, 70 meter long. So there we have to, to simulate the circulation of the fluid in any tube with different uh, scenarios, with uh, changing the energy daily, on daily basis, and on semester basis, on yearly basis. So all those things have to be done at that stage. So I was mentioning that there are some contractual aspects in those things. So when 
often what we do when we finish a construction, we do what we call an energy performance analysis. So we go to, to the place and we try to get experimentally and back analyze numerically on the long term the real performance of a construction that we designed. This is what we are doing currently, for instance, here in Geneva, where we have uh, an underground station. Actually, this station was uh, open to public uh, mid-December with the new metro line going from, uh, Switzerland to, going from Switzerland to France. This is our energy station, I call it like this. Actually, this energy is not needed for the station. So the, 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 the electrical company is about to sell this energy to other customers, but they invested in, uh, in, in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, system. So here you see the, the picture we're taking during the construction of uh, the station. Again, you see our uh, heat exchangers here, and you see them also here on the slabs, and here are the connecting uh, uh, systems. So what we, we are almost, uh, we are done with it, the, those uh, days. So we, we had, during three months, this energy performance analysis where we had the, the system functioning in real conditions with real trains and so on, and we had strain gauges measuring temperature, energy, but also uh, air, velocity, and also strains. So yeah, this is our uh, uh, monitoring system, and from it we get the values that we are looking for in terms of variation on temp of temperature. And what we have seen also that actually we are far from something that is homogeneously distributed even in terms of temperature. As you can see here, uh, the, the red parts, for instance, are where we have higher values of temperature with respect to others. So yeah, so we do those uh, energy performance analysis to really get confidence in the final design, and we predict with this a very long-term behavior of the infrastructure from energy perspective to allow contractors then to, to sell this energy. So let's now move to, to, to have a look to what's happened when we change temperature inside our infrastructure. So I will mainly focus here on, on piles. What's happened to piles when we have this temperature change? So basically, uh, as, as you know, piles behave in two groups. Either they behave as a single pile, so when the interaction between them is not significant, so usually when the, the ratio between the distance of piles to diameter is between five to 10, depends on the authors, or they could behave as a group of piles if the ratio is lower than that. So I will show you the, the behavior in the two different conditions because they do not behave the same way if you have isolated piles or we have a group of piles. Just to uh, mention here about the, the sign, compressive load will be positive, contractive strain positive, and upward sh shaft uh, will, will be positive, just to let us. So uh, I'm showing you here an institute test that we did on one of energy piles that is located on our campus in Lausanne. So basically, what, what uh, we observed uh, in looking to the behavior of such pile is that when you apply the load of the building, so which is your mechanical load, so basically you have a very conventional behavior of the pile, you have deformation, uh, uh, settlement of the pile, you have distribution of the shaft resistance and the load that is decreasing, and actually this is a floating pile, so we have nothing uh, at the tip. When we apply temperature variation of about 14 degrees Celsius in this case, what we observed in terms of additional vertical load in the pile is this red curve that you see here. So we are inducing something like additional 1,000 kilonewton of load inside the pile that initially actually, the, coming from the weight of the building, it was already uh, under a load of 1,000 kilonewton. So it means that instead of designing our pile for this green curve, we have to design our pile for the sum of the red curve and the green curve. So we suppose that we are in elastic behavior, so we, we superpose the loads. So in the design should be done with this curve that is the addition of the thermal and the mechanical load. Basically, for instance, in such case, we were getting something like 100 kilonewton of additional vertical load in the pile for one degree Celsius of increase of temperature. 
This is from one perspective. Then from the other perspective, which is in terms of deformation, so one have to notice, and I will show it in the next slide, that when you apply the vertical load first, you have your settlement of the pile, so you mobilize your friction to opposite to it, and you have your vertical displacement with respect to the shaft friction. When you hit your pile, you have two different behaviors inside your pile with respect to a given point, actually. That point, we call it a null point. You have a part of your pile that tends to go upward, while you have a part of it that tends to go downward. And this depends on the boundary conditions in terms of uh, stiffness of the ground and in terms of stiffness of the slab. But in any case, so we have a part of our pile that will allow somehow our piles in terms of uh, shaft uh, resistance because we are going up. And we have a part that will increase actually the displacement and we go down. So those things have to be considered also in the design from a uh, geotechnical perspective to, to know exactly with respect to the delta T that we are applying because we can decide somehow in our design where to put this null point to allow us to, to manage the things. And this is the sum of the two in terms of uh, temperature variation and the mechanical load for the load and for the shaft resistance. So that was for an isolated pile. Let's look now what's happened if we have a group of piles, so piles are close to each other. So this is what uh, we tested also in another building uh, in our campus. So I will show you the behavior of this group of piles. You see the distance between them is rather uh, short. The, they are 25 meter long piles. And what we, we do, we will, so we, ha we have plenty of transducers inside the piles, also in the ground and so on. So I will not go into details. And here we have the, different uh, geological profiles, so we have different kinds of, uh, uh, of materials. This is why the shape will not be necessarily homogeneous. But, but basically, if I have to make it in a schematic way, when we hit a pile, this pile will deform, will have an effect on the slab that will have effect on the other non-heated piles with the same level of temperature. This is on the short term. This is about two, three weeks will happen like this. So you can already guess that by applying this load here, it's like we are putting under tension already our pile. Then with the time, temperature will diffuse, heat will diffuse, so we have additional thermal deformation that will be induced in the other piles. So here we can already also guess that the short term is a more critical uh, issue uh, with respect to the long run. So here you see the, the in-situ measurement for temperature variation of 20 degrees Celsius. So see, this is the depth. This is our heated pile. So in the heated pile, everything is under compression. So we are increasing the vertical load inside the pile. From the other side, we, what we see here is a non-heated pile. So that is uh, by the effect of the slab affected by the, the heated pile, and what we see, we have compressive loads on the top of it, but we, what we have tensile loads on the bottom of it that we have to take care about in our design, and I will come back to this. Another important result uh, that uh, we got from it is that if we have to compare in terms of vertical strain, so average vertical strain that is induced by uh, uh, unit temperature, if you have just one pile heated with respect to a group of piles, the deformation of our foundation will be less significant. So the group of piles will induce more deformation. However, on the opposite, as it deforms more, group of piles will have less additional stresses in the foundation with respect to a single pile. So based on those knowledges, we developed the commercial software that we call a thermopile. It's used by many companies all around the world for those designs, but also by many universities for education purpose. So there is a student, free student version that is also available on our website. And uh, basically with um, this software, what we are doing actually, we are, it's a simple finite difference uh, model. So we started with the Collier Rice um, 
model in which we added things that were not considered in those non-conventional pies. And then the first thing that now we have to have a heat rigidity because conventional pies are, were supposed to just to function in, uh, as uh, under compression and going down. So here we can have uh, uplift of the foundation. So we added the heat rigidity, and we had to divide the, to define constitutive models for the interface between the soil and the concrete, but also for those rigidities. That takes into account the cyclic effect in terms of temperature, which means cyclic effect in terms of uh, deformation. So. So this is the TZ uh, relationship, so it's a con constitutive model between the shear stress and the displacement. So what we added are those red uh, boxes. So we use the Frank and Zhao model that is three linear uh, model and in which we added those uh, red parts allowing to a load here and their compression, but also a load to uh, a load here and their tension, a load and reload. So this is basically what the software is based on. And there are some other aspects that uh, I'm not discussing here is the fact, for instance, we don't know what is the null point when we start such design process. So the software will iterate in a non-linear uh, non, um, way to identify what is the null point and then to redistribute all the efforts and so on. And then, for instance, here you see back analysis to show that the software is able to reproduce what uh, experimentally is observed. Just recently, we enhanced this uh, analysis by considering the behavior of the slab. So uh, this is, uh, we are just about to publish this uh, book, in, uh, uh, this paper in ICE journal, where actually we, we added the coefficient here that actually smoothed the relationship in the TZ curves to take into account uh, the, the ratio between the average displacement of the group with respect to displacement of a single uh, pi. And again, the model is able to reproduce uh, the main features of the behavior of a group of piles, and this time with uh, a slab. In addition to this, again, we, as we did it for energy perspective, we try to do it for the geotechnical and structural aspect by having two levels in the design. Pre-design charts for practitioners for the pre-studies, and then the second part that is more developed uh, uh, design and analysis for specific cases. So for the pre-design case, we developed analytical models to analyze in an easy way such a problem. So you have a pile, you have diameters of those piles, their length, and we developed actually, by developing, I say, we extended two well-known theories uh, in the pile design. The first one is the equivalent peer method that we extended to non-isothermal conditions, and the second one is the interaction factor method. Why those two approaches? Because the current peer method is more efficient when the ratio between the length of the pile and diameter is lower than five. The interaction factor method is more efficient in the other case. So this is the equivalent peer method as was developed by Poulos, where the idea is to get the equivalent rigidity for a group of piles where you have rigidity of the concrete, you have rigidity of the soil, and uh, you use the ratio between the two to compile uh, the equivalent rigidity for uh, your peer. So this is how uh, was the uh, equivalent peer method at the beginning, and this we added to it now, the fact that we have temperature variation, so we are inducing deformation inside the pile, we are inducing deformation inside the concrete, the ratio between the two uh, areas, so the, in terms of, uh, uh, of section, so R is included, but there is an important factor that has to be added here that do not exist in conventional approaches, is the fact that the ratio between the temp thermal dilation coefficient of the ground and the thermal dilation coefficient of the concrete play a major role, because the one who has the highest one is, will be the driving in the process of deformation and stress with respect to the other one. And this is, there is no, uh, let's say, general rule about which one is more important in those two coefficients. Each case is a different case. We can know more or less the one of concrete, but the one of soil depends each time on the place where we are. So, yeah, the, the model reproduced basically what we observe experimentally, so this is not the point. This is now uh, how we extended the interaction factor 
uh, approach. Basically, the interaction factor approach is based on the fact that we know the deformation or displacement of a given pile, and we'd like to know how the all surrounding piles will affect the, dis the displacement of this pile, not only by its temperature change, but also temperature change of all others. So for that, we, do, we introduce a, a factor here that is the additional displacement to address a pile to the displacement of our initial pile. So the process is based on the fact to get the value of the displacement from displacement of a given pile at different distance. So there are two ways to do it. Either we do it with the layer model, so it basically is the shear modulus of the soil that play a role in getting the value of displacement at different distance from the, this main one, or we use Mendel theory for elasticity to, to get the, pro, the, the diffusion. The point in it is that when you use those approaches, you are supposing that the displacement of the adjacent pile is having the same characteristics as the one of the soil. So there is an additional correction that we introduce to get the rigidity of the other piles uh, in the analysis, uh, no matter which method we use. And basically, we come to a final point where analytically we can get for, from a given pile what is the effect in terms of displacement and all surrounding piles. So basically, this is uh, what the exercise is about. So then we can, as it's an analytical solution, we can do it for plenty of configurations of designs. It's really easy to handle for plenty of temperature variations. And this is why we came with charts for pre-design for practitioners, where it's really easy that you get your interaction factor by introducing your geometrical values, the ratio between the diameter and the, the length, for different uh, ratios between the equivalent uh, Young modulus and the shear, uh, the shear modulus. So you can get the, those kind of uh, charts. You can have them also for different Poisson ratio, different shapes. So all those things allows you to immediately, for any kind of, of uh, foundation, to design your, uh, to pre-design your foundation with those charts. Last point that I would like to spend a few minutes to talk about is what I was mentioning before, this aspect related to tensile stresses and the way that should be handled. Uh, actually, uh, in the design uh, codes or guidelines, we consider that structural effect of thermal load is based only on linear elastic behavior. This is what we have in our design codes, so it means that something should be really here to consider with attention, because there is no attention that is giving to the effect of reinforced concrete cracking. Why we are having this cracking? Because we have seen that we may have those tensile stresses, so if you have tensile stresses, we may have, I will show you in conditions, we may have cracking. So those things are happening in really extreme situations, so they are not that often, but we have to consider them. And there are two possible uh, situations. We may have those uh, potential tensile stresses in compressed piles when we cool them in a significant way. The second aspect is when simply you apply those tensile force because you are hitting a given pile. Your considered pile is not heated. You have the slab connecting them, so you are applying a load to it. So uh, for instance, the, the, this is an example. This is. Uh, uh, a known house um, uh, in Marseille, in the south of France, where the configuration of uh, the, the system make, if you look, here we have different uh, categories of piles. We put four of them. Uh, what you see in blue is the axial uh, effort, the axial load that we get when we apply the mechanical load. And then when we apply temperature variation, so a part of the piles are under compression, no, no problem, but there is a part of piles that will be under tension, and there are those kinds of pipes that we are interested in here. So to manage that, so we have to use a, a constitutive model that consider the appearance of cracks and allows you to quantify the amount 
of um, deformation in those cases. Here we are extending the model of Marty and all. So we, we have three components in it, the one related to the concrete. So as I mentioned before, negative is tension, compression is uh, positive. So we have here the limit uh, in terms of uh, tension. We have the steel until the elastic limit of it. And we have what is very important, the interface between the concrete and the steel. So when you yield your, your material, at the beginning, the concrete is taking apart. Then immediately, it will be the steel which takes your tensile effort. But at a given time, you reach the ultimate uh, limit also for the tensile strength of the steel. So in that case, at the interface between the steel and concrete, you have this drop that will generate deformation, generate displacement. So basically, if we have to look to, to this drop, we will generate a part of cracks. Those cracks will generate by a, a kind of a symmetrical uh, aspect depending on the boundary conditions. And here you see the, the value of uh, shear stress that you have uh, there, the vertical uh, or the, uh, the sigma s and the, the, and the deformation that is generated. So what we see here is that we don't have a homogeneous response anymore of our pile. So the, in the inside the pile, the displacement will be heterogeneous depending on those cracks that we are generating. So basically, if we reproduce here our pile, we have this tensile force that is applied by the slab. So depending on the amount of deformation that we are generating, either we are still in elastic before cracking, elastic domain before cracking, or we could be at different points with different magnitude of deformation with cracks. And uh, to to simulate this now and to be able to quantify this in, uh, in a rigorous way, so we developed a, a model, a finite element model used, uh, using uh, bars that we call a thermobar uh, model, where actually uh, in, with the theory of the bars, we introduced a constitutive law like this one with the uh, three uh, elements for the soil pile interface. We used the nonlinear equation uh, for, for the behavior, and the temperature effect, we transformed it in terms of deformation, so this allows us to, know, to relate the value of the effort to the amount of uh, deformation. So the temperature now starts to be a deformation and posed uh, effect. And I will just go quickly to conclude. Basically, uh, wh what we are showing here is this is the kind of cracks that may form if we apply just mechanical load, the type of cracks that may generate if you apply thermal load, and the sum of them. And the key word, or the main message that I would like just to give here as a concluding uh, word of, for my talk on this aspect is that the magnitude of the imposed thermal strain in such conditions could be higher than the simple alpha delta T, which is the maximum temperature that we get for a homogeneous pile. So why this is important? Because there are in some standards, uh, this approach consists in saying, we design our pile in uh, conventional ways, then we analyze the two worst scenario conditions. One is completely blocked pile, so we have the maximum stress in it, and one is completely free pile where we have the maximum possible displacement. In this case, it's not enough because that Free pile is alpha delta T. If you have cracks, it will be higher than the alpha delta T. Okay, so there are ways to, to manage uh, those cracks when we get them, so either by reinforcing um, the, the crack effort or the plastic uh, uh, strains that must penetrate in the uncracked part. So to conclude, I would like to say First of all, those energy geostructures, they perform exceptionally well. They are really, really, they have a really great potential in development in providing energy to uh, our needs. I think, as I said in the introduction, that geotechnical engineers, they have a critical role and they have really opportunity to take lead on this emerging technology. Otherwise, other areas or other fields will do it. And I try to show you that we develop design tools for energy and for uh, geotechnical and structural aspects at two levels, those needed for the pre-design and then those that are needed later on for the real design of a project. Thank you very much for your attention.
So I was told that uh, there is opportunity to ask questions. So if yeah. there are questions, we'd we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, uh, so in theory, there is no limit, but uh, it depends on which kind of design that you are doing. If you are doing this just for heating purpose or just for cooling purpose, it means that you are going one way in the system. So you have the, your constant temperature, let's say 13 degrees Celsius, and you try each time, for instance, to decrease it, to heat the building, to decrease it to five degrees Celsius then the ground will try to come back to 13, but you can go faster and you decrease again, you go to two degrees Celsius. So you, you, you may go in this process, but each time the ground will tend to come back to its value, but depends in your scenario how fast you would like to extract the energy. So this is if you have one-way system. If you have, or if you don't have also enough groundwater flow uh, in the area. So basically, a critical value that we consider is 0 0.5 meter per day, not by second, just we did it for uh, easiness purpose, but 0 0.5 meter per day as Darcy velocity is the needed recharge hydraulically virus. If the scenario is to heat and cool, so then you are storing and extracting. In that case, you don't have to care absolutely at all because the system is entirely renewable with this heating and cooling. So there are uh, some criteria uh, in design in some countries where you have to prove that over a, a period of 50 years, the maximum change of temperature in the ground that you may induce is about five degrees Celsius. So then it means that you have to make simulations with some uh, uh, hypothesis, obviously, to really show that we remain with our extraction and injection or without necessarily extraction and injection, depends what we do that we remain in this envelope of maximum five degree Celsius. Suzanne, you have? Ah. Okay. Okay, one more. Yeah. For longer, you know, because uh, you install this one and you uh, collect uh, heat and you think that because you see embedded in the pores or in the slab and you think that how long it lasts and how to maintain, you know, the, it will last for long. So uh, actually it, it lasts forever. So it's as uh, long as will be uh, the life of the construction. So is as efficient as the steel, for instance, that you have there or concrete. However, the most critical part in the installation is the installation by itself, is the first moment when we install. So when we install the, pile, uh, the tubes, we put them under pressure. So we, for each cycle of tubes, we have manometer. Pressure we can apply between three to six uh, bars. And then we uh, put the concrete, we uh, let the concrete uh, shrink and uh, cool down and so on, and we check our manometer to ensure that this pressure remains there, which means we did not fail our, uh, our tubes. Since the concrete uh, is there, then the tubes will not move uh, anymore, so they are completely uh, in safe condition. So the most critical part is really during the installation. So then th th there are uh, in the project uh, that we are running, for instance, uh, some of them, uh, contractors have to engage on a given rate of success in uh, putting those uh, tubes, usually between 20, uh, 95 to 97%. So we can have some fail, but it should not be, let's say, more than 5%. And this is engagement that contractors have to respect. Thank you, Dr. Lalui. Very interesting talk.